Greetings from the University of Notre Dame Press. My name is Christopher Rio Suvercruby, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at Notre Dame Press. We are excited to be here today under the auspices of our Books for Better Understanding author event series. Today's feature author is Norman Wiersba, whose upcoming book, Agrarian Spirit, Cultivating Faith, Community, and the Land, will be published by Notre Dame Press in August of 2022. Jeff Bilbro joins us from Pennsylvania. Let me begin by introducing our esteemed guests. Norman Wiersba is the Gilbert T. Rowe Distinguished Professor of Christian Theology at Duke University and a senior fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics. He is the author and editor of 16 books in theology, religion, and philosophy, including This Sacred Life, Humanity's Place in a Wounded World. Jeff Bilbro is an associate professor of English at Grove City College, an editor of the Front Porch Republic, and a contributor to The Liberating Arts. He is the author of a number of books in theology and literary studies, including Virtues of Renewal, Wendell Berry's Sustainable Forms. Thank you both for being here today. Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you today, Norman, about your new book, which I very much enjoyed. Uh, and uh, yeah, I thought I would start off with a question about the intellectual lineage that you're working on. You've been writing about agrarian theology and philosophy for a long time. And early on in your career, you, you wrote or edited what remains, I think, the best anthology of Barry's essays. So uh, I'm just curious if you could kind of draw out for, for prospective readers what aspects of this new book are consonant with that early work and with Barry's writings, but also how your thinking has evolved or sharpened over time and where else you've been drawing uh, inspiration from. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, I think I'd start by saying that when I first encountered Wendell, I, I was completely surprised by this body of work that we call today agrarian writing, because, you know, I had grown up farming, I had thought that I had left farming behind, I had been studying French and German philosophy and theology, and there was never a farmer in sight. And so I just thought that you know, this would be interesting to read for more sort of personal reasons, you know, hearing from a Kentucky farmer. And I was completely unprepared for the insight that I got from Wendell and from many others that he introduced me to, into the idea that agrarianism is a comprehensive cultural position, that it's not simply uh, some writing that we might do for farmers who are, as you know, decreasing in number all around the world. And so I really put my mind to thinking about, well, what would this mean for philosophers and theologians to take seriously the agrarian position, which is not something as simple as saying, well, let's add land to the varying themes that we might take up in our work. But what would it mean if land and human embeddedness in the land were the starting point for our reflection about major philosophical and theological questions? And I think... Um, that has been a project that's been ongoing. It's a long project. I'm never going to finish it. And I think what this book, Agrarian Spirit, does is it tries to really focus in on what I think are the, the sort of changes in spiritual practices that people might want to consider when thinking about how they pray, when they think about how they perceive the world, or when they think about you know something as important as, as hope uh, in our context. Because I think agrarians have so much to teach people, even if they are not farmer. And, and the reason that's important to stress is that, as Barry says, as long as we eat, we can't ever think we've exceeded the land or escaped the land. And so I, I want to sort of locate place these spiritual practices in agrarian traditions of, of insight, but also agrarian traditions of work and being in the world. Yeah, I think that's helpful. And certainly Barry uh, stands uh, as a seminal figure there for his his wide ranging work. And there's a lot, a lot to explore uh, in that comprehensive vision. One of the things I really appreciated about agrarian spirit was the way that you draw not just on the North American agrarian tradition. And, you know, in Barry's fairness, he also draws pretty widely and has traveled quite, quite widely internationally and talk to farmers in other parts of the world. But you draw a lot on the Black agrarian tradition uh, in America, and then from uh, Indigenous communities and farmers outside North America. So I, I thought maybe you could reflect on how diff you know, the different agrarianisms, as it were, and, and what contrasts or commonalities you might see across yeah. these traditions. 
Yeah, that's a really important observation because, you know, agrarians, as you know, and you've written about, they are people who think specifically out of particular places. And so there isn't anything like farming in general, because the practices of farming are going to vary depending on where you are. And the cultural contexts are always changing too. So for instance, I grew up in Western Canada in Alberta, where the question of African-American farming just wasn't the issue because that's not what we encountered in Western Canada. Our major issue was not the enslavement of African-Americans, it was the displacement of indigenous peoples, right? So there's a constellation of cultural questions that are different there than they would be, say, in in the American South, where, you know, as I live now in North Carolina, it's still very clear that the legacy of slavery is everywhere, right? That we can't make sense of so many of the world's economies, even, apart from coerced labor and enslaved bodies. And so it's become more important to me, especially as I think about agrarianism and what it has to say to political economy, right? Not just personal virtues and vices, but political economy. Um, It becomes so important that one lift up and bring to view the very particular powers that have brought about the shape of not just an agricultural landscape, but also foodscapes, energy scapes, And that means looking at how in different parts of the world, those histories of political formation, economic development have varied. And so the context in say, Bandana Shiva's India is going to be quite different than the context uh, of Thomas Jefferson's America or something like that. So noting that is is really important. And in this book in particular, I also wanted to lift up African-American voices because we need to understand That from the very beginning, even 10,000 years ago, agricultural peoples found themselves in positions where they were coerced into labor by political elites. And we need to hear from those people who have been subjugated and oppressed to understand the truth, the full truth, of how agricultural economies have worked to the disadvantage of many people and certainly to the disadvantage of many lands and to the benefit of a very small number of people. And we now know that there is no viable future for farming apart from a farming that now takes seriously the health and the integrity of land and people together. Yeah, and I appreciate that, uh, to use your term, kind of a uh, robust sense of political economy that you bring to this project. And yet, uh, at the same time, I wouldn't want to give people the wrong impression that it's a kind of uh, abstract political theory book. It is very grounded in um, spiritual practices and disciplines. And I think that's one of the interesting, maybe somewhat unique contributions that this book makes to the agrarian conversation. So Maybe that's a way of getting at uh, another question that you've already raised, in, in, I think, in your first answer, which is that agrarianism sometimes comes to be perceived as just for farmers. And if uh, you're not one of the 2% of Americans who actively farm, uh, it's irrelevant to you. So what are the origins of that misconception? Why is it still so difficult for uh, those of us who don't work yeah. on the farm every day? to understand ourselves as part of uh, agricultural practices. Yeah. And then um, maybe secondly, how can, can those of us, again, who don't farm every day, still um, learn from and practice a kind of agrarian spirituality or agrarian wisdom? Yeah, no, that's another really good question. And I think I would start by saying how we need to help people understand how unusual our cultural moment yeah. is, Okay. So I, in, in one of the chapters, I talk about urbanization, and, and the point is not to just sort of harangue against urban life per se, because, you know, I live in an urban context myself, but it's to point to some of the features of contemporary urbanism that are genuinely new in the history of the world. And I think we need to help, help people understand that we are living in a moment unlike any in the history of humanity in which most people have no sort of insightful understanding, even sympathetic appreciation for where their food comes from, where their water comes from, how their energy is supplied. There's been a kind of insularity that has grown up alongside contemporary forms of urbanism, but also contemporary forms of economic life 
such that most people secure their livelihoods by shopping, right? And we do that increasingly online, right? Which means that the typical person who eats and drinks and consumes energy, buys clothing, whatever, that person is more detached from the context of their eating than in the history of the whole of humanity. That's something people just need to understand. And what I want to, to do is I want to help people, first of all, recover themselves as embodied beings who never exceed their watersheds, their food sheds. They need to know how they're living, how they're spending, how they're voting has real world effects for the inescapable ecological, but also social context that make it possible for them to do whatever it is they do. So the spiritual practices that I try to develop in the book are going to be ones that, on the one hand, heighten our awareness of our situatedness in land so that even if we're living in a suburb or a high-rise apartment or whatever, the fact that we eat draws those threads that connect us to particular landscapes, that draw, draw us particularly to the kinds of water that we're going to need to drink and the kinds of air we're going to need to breathe. And, you know, there's a lot about, you know, today's visual culture that, that wants to give us a stylized, abstracted, usually fairly pleasant depiction of our ability to live in a world as if land and water don't really matter. But uh, the minute you actually think about what you do, in fact, eat, what you do, in fact, drink, uh, you're going to have to be drawn back to particular places. And we need to understand then that these places are highly vulnerable. We need to understand how much they've been abused by an economy that is in many instances still very rapacious. And so that's a kind of awakening, but it's also then a kind of inspiration, I think, for people to perceive how in their shopping, right? I'm not, I'm not advocating that everybody go out and buy a farm. I'm not advocating that everybody go out and grow a huge garden, right? Those are not things that are going to be viable for most people. But what I am saying is that in the shopping that you do, in the voting you do, you have the opportunity uh, to affect the kinds of policy that will have real world implications for farming communities, for, for people who are growing food, people who are you know, extracting energy uh, from our, our world. That's going to be so important for us to do because to put it fairly grandly, the future of our life depends on this. Um, it's, it's a bit dismaying to hear um, some folks talk about an economy in terms of only its survivability for 10 or 20 years. We need to be thinking about what's the economy we need that will take us into thousands of years going forward. And that, that's a very different framework than something like a quarterly business sheet or something like that. Yeah, and I think in your answer, we get at what's so brilliant about Barry's formulation that eating is an agricultural act, because if we, if we begin there, then we have so many opportunities to recognize our membership in our places and communities every time we take a bite, and then hopefully to begin to exercise that membership more responsibly, right? And, and recognize that we're implicated so broadly. Yeah. Um, and that comes with responsibilities that we have to work out, uh, even if, as you say, we're not all gonna, gonna go buy a farm. Right. You know, and I think you've written about this yourself in your book on education, right? We're talking about the formation of peoples to have certain kinds of seeing, certain kinds of tasting, certain kinds of feeling. Right. And, and those are inherently spiritual practices. And, and I think what is helpful in, in this agrarian position is it makes the spiritualities, the kinds of people formation that you and I are both very interested in, it makes it something deeply incarnate and embodied and economic. And so the kinds of spirituality that, you know, I've read about for many, many years that I've encountered in many instances, they tend to be so etherealized, so spiritualized, as if the whole point of a spiritual life was to extricate bodies as, you know, not the most important things. The so soul is the most important thing. And I think uh, you, you and I both want to try to resist that Gnostic or dualistic uh, kinds of, kind of impulse and, and really put spiritual life uh, in the heart of our day-to-day -day living. Yeah. And in the heart, as you put it, of our economies, right? Um, right. That, that it, these are not separate spheres, but they're all implicated in each other. Uh, one of the questions I had about your... Uh, 
your your thinking and your your spiritual practices in this book that I would love to hear you talk about is this kind of tension between um, your own convictions uh, of pretty explicit crystal, Christian theology, and yet your efforts also to be ecumenical or hospitable to spiritual traditions outside of Christianity. Uh, and I think for the most part that that's really persuasive in your book, but I would just love to hear you expand on this and, and how you think we should navigate the need to be explicit about, you know, sometimes exclusionary theological claims, right. but also the, at the same time, the need to look for common ground across religious traditions and, yeah. um, uh, yeah, and, and share wisdom right. with people who might differ from us on certain points. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's so many dimensions to this question. I think I think I'll start with this. Agrarianism, if it's about anything, it's about making our reflection true to our lived experience, our working experience of making a life together in a place. Okay. And this, of course, is a task that has been humanity's task from the beginning. And it's a task that has been developed, attempted, failed at, improved upon in every culture of the world, whether as hunters and gatherers, whether as explicit farmers, whether as you know, industrialists, what have you. We've all been engaged in this work of trying to secure our livelihoods. And it's not surprising then that so many of the world's religious and philosophical traditions have had to think very deeply about what it is they are doing. Because when you secure your own life or the life of your community, you're engaged in some activities that are profoundly um, inspiring, profoundly terrifying. Um, I mean, just to start with the basic fact that for any of us to eat, others have to die, even if you're a vegetarian, right? So that's, that's a major thing for people to have to grapple with. And so the world's religious traditions you know, they've all thought about this and they've all come up with ways that, you know, affirm the sanctity of life or that address the suffering that is inherent in every life. And so for us to think that only one tradition has a way of fully understanding or dealing with this very, very fraught, but also very beautiful existential circumstance, that's just hugely arrogant. Now, that's one, one thing to say. So we, we want to learn from the different traditions of this world because the experiences that we're all trying to make sense of are so deep, profound, and disturbing. The second layer, I think, is that we can't talk about religion in general or spirituality in general, even though there might be some shared you know, themes or even dispositions that emerge from them because just like every place is different, every way people attempt to make sense of their life in a place is going to be tr- different, and it's going to be culturally shaped. And you know, the the, the, sh- the culture that has shaped me has, has certainly been a Christian one, but it, I've also been shaped very much by Jewish thinking, indigenous writers. And so, what I would love to see is that the various traditions of the world help each other understand how they can speak across religious philosophical traditions, but also to members of their own philosophical and religious traditions about what are the resources within them that can really illuminate the complexity and the beauty of our entanglements in flesh and in places. I remember, I remember having a conversation with Robin Kimmerer about this because you know her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is such a beautiful description of indigenous ways of thinking about these very fundamental matters. I said to her, I said, what, what do you think about, you know, people like me coming along, reading Braiding Sweetgrass and appropriating your indigenous insights? And, and she, of course, in her beautiful way would say, you know, it's not a problem that you're reading what I'm doing, but I would encourage you to go deep into your own tradition. What's there? What's there that's troubling, that needs correction? What's there that's beautiful, that needs retrieval? Because I'm not going to become, you know, First Nations person. Uh, That's not for me to do or even possible for me to do. But what I can do is I can learn from people like Robin Kimmerer and many others, obviously, as a way then to go back to my own traditions and try to retrieve what's there that we can work with, that we can develop or amend or correct uh, that will help us because we're not asked to be something other than what we can be. Yeah, I'm reminded of what Barry writes, and I'm going to 
I can't think of the essay right now, but he talks about how in some ways his relationship to Christianity is like his relationship to his marginal abused farm. Uh, it's where he is. And just like he needs to care for the farm and help, help it recover from its past abuses. So that same posture can be applied fruitfully to, to the Christian tradition that right. uh, there's a lot of, a lot of good potential there that uh, needs to be recovered and tended and cared for. So right. I think that's a, um, a, a beautiful attitude to have toward our own traditions and one that's, that's uh, intrinsically hospitable toward what we can learn from, from others. Yeah, I like your use of the word hospitable. I think that's spot on. I think what we're going to need to figure out is how to be hospitable with each other and with our places. Yeah. Um, because it's, it's the mode of hospitality which makes room for others, welcomes others, nurtures others that is going to be the path forward. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask two kind of more specific questions. I'm not going to get into all of the disciplines that you discuss in this book, um, but each one is obviously quite uh, rich and bears a lot of reflection and, then of course, a lot of practice. But uh, two, why don't you talk about our crisis of seeing? And I think that's a, a good way of putting it and how one of the causes of this crisis, one of our, our, of our uh, failures to attend well, seems to be our disconnection from place and land. So I wonder if you could talk about how the practice of getting our hands dirty, the practice of in, in, involving our bodies in our places, might actually change the way that we then can see and attend to them. Yeah. So just think about this word to know. What does it mean to know something? I think in our world where so much of the knowing that we attempt comes through screens on pages even, and registers in the form of data or information, almost guarantees that the knowing we have is going to be more superficial. It's a knowledge that's based on observation. And there's a lot of good in that. I'm not trying to knock it all together, right? I, I, I will never, I don't expect, get to many places of the world, but I can know about them. But it's not the kind of knowledge that grows from a kind of intimacy or the kind of knowledge that grows out of our participation in what we attempt to know. So what's at stake in the agrarian position, which I think is absolutely fundamental, so important for people to appreciate, is that agrarianism is not an idea. It's first a practice because it's only in the work, right? The, the taking care of animals, yeah. the taking care of a field, the dealing with the frustrations of, you know, of crop failure, right? That we come to understand something very important about what I call our creaturely condition, which is to say that we're limited, that we're vulnerable, that we're fragile, but that we're also beautiful, that we have the potential to do so much good. And this is something that is known most viscerally when you actually try to do the work that agrarians call us to do, which is the care of each other and our places. And, you know, just to give just a, a little example of this, you know, I, I teach agrarian themes often in my courses and students though, you know, they're, they're, they're quite interested having not themselves ever farmed, but they're attracted. And they, they sense that there's something right about the position but then sometimes a really beautiful thing happens where a student will then go off over the summer and, and do an internship or something where they work on a farm for months yeah. and they come back and they say, I had no idea, right? You know, I, I read the stuff, I admired the stuff, but then when I actually got involved in growing things, taking care of things, I realized that I really didn't understand. And so the, the, the kind of participatory knowledge that we're talking about, where it's your self-involvement that brings about the insight, is of a fundamentally different kind, not necessarily opposed, but of a different kind than the kind of knowing that we do by reading books. And I, I recognize that it's not going to be in everybody's ability to go out and work on a farm for months or years, or even to do extensive gardening, right? That's not possible for everybody to do. So yeah, we're not gonna be able to know or recommend this kind of knowing for everyone, but even so we can do in smaller steps, the kinds of things like grow some plants, yeah. commit yourself to the care of a neighborhood, right? Or of a community park, Right? Or to ask the question with your neighbors, what would it be like for us to advocate for some better food in our neighborhood for people? 
what if we tried to do some things together that are like community revitalization projects, which, you know, urban contexts make possible. And of course, you know, one change that, you know, I could point to since when I first started reading this stuff is this, the explosion of urban agriculture and the explosion of local economies, right? These, these are important efforts, not because they're going to feed the whole world necessarily, but because they put consumers in closer touch with producers. And in that sort of relationship, something like a more participatory understanding develops. And that's really beautiful when that can happen. Yeah, and you're obviously right to, uh, you know, with the caveat, to say the caveat that we can all become farmers. But I do think it's also um, incredible how many opportunities there are to get our get started somehow. I have a friend, John Lindstrom, who's a uh, uh, L.H. Bailey scholar, and he, um, you know, he lives in New York City, goes to grad school, and he has several amazing pots on his windowsill in New York. And, uh, you know, if you can't study Bailey without growing something, uh, but he, <laughs> yeah. he, even in the urban context, he can have his basil and his other herbs and tend those. And um, I think that it, when you do that, you begin to change. And then I think it opens your eyes to the other opportunities you're describing. Yeah, no, that's really great. I, I have a, a class where sometimes I will have students grow something as part of the class. And no. it's remarkable because I say, Keep a journal every week in which you write down what you're experiencing. And, and what's so, so great is they often will write in the first week, I had no idea what to do. I had no idea where to get soil. I had no idea how to get seed. I didn't know what to do with the seed once I got it. And then about halfway through, a bunch of them say, well, I killed the plant. And, 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 they're, and they're a bit horrified by that because you would think just raising one sort of salad leaf shouldn't be that hard to do, but it is. And it's a revelation to students to discover how easy it is to kill something, not through any malicious intent, but simply through neglect, simply through ignorance. And that's, of course, an insight into our own creaturely condition, which Absolutely. we can try to cultivate in people wherever they are. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's just... Uh remarkable i guess how you can start so small and yet the uh the insights and the consequences can be so uh profound both interior and in interior sense but also then in our hopefully in our communities and yeah uh, the rest of our lives uh i wanted to ask one more question about this practice your your, your chapter on hope i think is quite good and it's maybe the most common kind of question that somebody like a Barry gets or somebody who's dealing with, you know, issues of the Anthropocene or climate crises. Uh, and one of the things you write about in there is the, the prevalence of a kind of pre-traumatic distress yeah. syndrome um, that can be induced by the terrifying barrage of predictions and news. So in this context where, where trauma is already on ongoing and, and where, the, the fear of catastrophe has become so prevalent. What might it look like to practice hope as a discipline and to do yeah. so well? Because it seems such, such a crucial discipline to, to cultivate yeah. right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you get this when you go talking in different places. You know, you, you, <laughs> That's you why know. I'm asking you. <laughs> I know, I mean, we have to be the purveyors of all the bad news of what's going on, right? Right. And so almost without fail, at the end of the Q&A or you know, even at the start of it, the question is, well, what gives you hope? Yeah. And, and I have taken to now saying, that's not a question I want to answer. I want to switch the question. I want to say, what gives you love or what yeah. animates your love or what do you love? Because, you know, Barry has this, just a little line, but he says, hope is in the means, not in the ends. Right. Okay. That's, that's a crucial thing to keep in mind because first of all, we don't know the ends. We don't know what things are going to be like 20 years from now, or even 10 years from now. I mean, who could have imagined that we would be looking at a major war effort right now that is that has the potential to, to really overturn the geopolitical order as we know it, right? These things are always beyond our, our comprehension and prediction. So rather than just worrying about all the bad things, which we, we can't even fully grasp, but also without just saying we'll stick our head in the sand and pretend nothing bad is coming, because we know a lot of bad things are in store, I find that it's, it's much more helpful to ask people, where do they want to turn their love? Because first of all, if, if there's nothing that you can love, then hope is lost, I would say. 
But if you know that there are things that you love and you want to, to figure out what does the love that you have for them require of you, then you're on a different footing. And love doesn't make promises that say, okay, you know, because I love you, everything is going to be okay. Okay. I mean, we all know this, that when you decide to love a friend, you don't know that the friend will always be the friend you want them to be, or the child that you love will be the child you hope for them to be. We know none of that. But what we do know is what the love requires of us today. And as long as we can help each other figure out the things to love and how to best activate the love. And that, of course, means taking it beyond just sort of personal piety or sentimentality. It takes us into economic, political practices, because if we're going to say that we're going to commit to loving some of the children that are in our neighborhood, we're going to do something about the school system, about the kinds of housing that they're enduring or not. So love when you make that the launching point, which is not a sidestepping away from right. love at all no. or from hope, it actually helps us, I think, reframe the matter of what we're asking for. Because, you know, I learned this from uh, my friend Kyle Powell's White, a Native American philosopher at, at Michigan. He said, we need to be deeply suspicious of the purveyors of hope because hope so often creates the ultimate bystander effect. Yeah. Right? And what he means by that is that, you know, if we say, well, I have hope, then we sort of check out. We say, I don't need to deal with it because, you know, Elon Musk is going to solve right. it or God's going to fix it or right. whatever. And those are, those are dreadful, right? Those are evasions of life and evasions of responsibility and therefore are actually a, a sign of the hopelessness that needs no. to be combated. Instead, what we need to figure out is how do you talk about and sort of activate hope, which is a self-involving posture and discipline. And, and if you make love the launching point, you start with what you know, with what's around you. And, and I think that that's a, a much better place because when you, when you focus on things close at hand, uh, you have the chance of seeing some success, seeing why the loving that you do matters and produces beauty and goodness in the world yeah. rather than the things that we're so afraid of. Yeah, that's great. And I, I hope that this, uh, this taste of uh, the discussion will persuade prospective readers to go out and uh, get your book and uh, get the fuller, the fuller version there. So thank you, Norman. Well, thanks for having this conversation, Jeff. It was great. This, is, this has been great. So I wonder if to close, either of you have any closing comments about why this book should matter to readers that you'd like to share with our listeners today? Wow. I mean, I would just add to what uh, Norman's already alluded to that if you think uh, agrarianism is just for farmers, or if you think that it's just about, um, you know, climate change or economics or politics, then I think this is, a, is the right book because it opens up uh, agrarianism as a posture that uh, should have implications for all of our lives, and in particular, uh, our, our spiritual lives and our spiritual practices. Yeah. I think what I would say is, you know, a number of earth system scientists, social scientists, even artists are talking about how we live in this era called the Anthropocene, right? And it's a pretty scary reality. And Ed Wilson once said that it, we should better call it the Eremocene, right? The age of loneliness. And I think that's what I would want to point to right now is that so many people feel lonely and disconnected. They don't know that they, they don't feel that their lives matter, have purpose. And I think the great virtue, the great merit of, of agrarian traditions is they're all about establishing connections. They're all about people coming together in their places to realize, not just think about, but to realize the beautification of places so that we can feel how the life that we live can be beautiful. That the life we live doesn't need to be a lonely life, but can be a life in which we feel the beauty and the power of life circulating through us and through our lands. And, and that's something that I think people long for and agrarian practices have a way of helping us get there. Outstanding. I wanna thank you both, Norman Wiersma and Jeff Bilbro for being here today and for speaking with us. It has been a pleasure sitting in on your conversation about Norman's upcoming book, Agrarian Spirit, Cultivating Faith, Community, and the Land. 
The book is available for pre-order and will be available in print in August of 2022, wherever books are sold. We encourage you to visit and support your local independent bookstores, either in person or online, or you can order the book through the Notre Dame Press website at undpress.nd.edu. Thank you. Thanks so much. Good to be with you.